do we study evolution? One way is to look at how closely related organisms are. Scientists, known as systematists, use branching diagrams called phylogenies to visualize this pattern over evolutionary time. Think of phylogenies as family trees, with the trunk over here all the way to the left, representing a common ancestor of all the organisms represented on these branch tips to the right. The pattern of branching tells you how organisms evolved. Species with fewer branching points between them are more closely related, while those that are far apart are less likely to share many traits. Why does it matter to know how organisms are related to each other? There are three broad reasons. Diversity, origins, and directions. Let's check this out through an example. By placing these species into a phylogenetic tree, we can see that ants branched off first, followed by the wasps, and then finally bees. The tree tells us when each group originated in evolutionary time. Finally, we can place traits onto the branches of the tree to tell in what direction the organisms are evolving. For example, bees have a pollen basket, but is this because all groups leading up to bees did, or is this a trait that is unique to bees? Placing the pollen basket on the tree, we can see that the only groups with this trait are the bees, and so we can be confident that the evolution of a pollen basket is unique to bees and not inherited from a common ancestor that they share with ants and wasps. Phylogenies give a context to an organism and its characters that allow us to effectively study its life history, ecology, and behavior. Recent advancements in genetics and computer science have made the field of systematics more exciting than ever allowing scientists to look at and analyze data in ways researchers 100 years ago or even 60 years ago when DNA was discovered couldn't even dream of. But nothing beats looking at specimens under a microscope. Large insect collections like the Cornell University Insect Collection we're in now are better than Disneyland because they contain insects collected from around the world. This collection has about 7 million specimens and is actively adding more all the time. The specimens are pinned, labeled, organized, and arranged in cabinet upon cabinet of drawers. Visiting researchers and in-house scientists utilize these specimens to investigate the insect tree of life. Regardless of what a scientist studies, collections are there to make it possible. Insect collections and collections that hold other organisms are essential for documenting the nature and pattern of biological change. Since new specimens are added every day, a collection acts as a time capsule that stores a slice of a region's natural history for future generations. Today, we take advantage of past collectors' efforts to investigate how populations and individuals change over time in response to human activities. Collections are indispensable in determining which organisms are native and which are invasive to a region, and also how populations change to the climate over time. A great example of this is the Rocky Mountain locusts, which we have here in the Cornell University Insect Collection. These locusts went extinct in the 1880s as a result of both climactic changes and human activities. The best part about collecting insects is that you don't need a PhD to do it. The next time you're taking a walk or are just outside, peer into some bushes and see if you can find some insects. While looking at them, ask yourselves, why do they look the way they do? And what was the evolutionary trek that their ancestors had to take to reach to their current forms today?